<laughs> Let's take a few more questions. Um, one here and one behind and one in the far corner. As fast as you can so we can get a few in. Before yeah, uh, we have to Carl go. Drage from the Ground Source Heat Pump Association. I'm pleased to say as an aside, 20 years ago I did a Crest Award. Um, my members are solving the government's uh, carbon emissions targets by installing ground source heat pumps in commercial and domestic buildings. We don't need uh, the top scientists coming from universities, but we have a problem with implementation. We need technicians, and they used to be supplied by the polytechnics, mm. and I need people, uh, I employ a lot of Polish people who are great plumbers and electricians, and I can't find them in the UK. What, what's being done about that? Thank you. Hi. Uh, Will Stewart, actually here representing the Institution of Engineering and Technology. And my degrees are from physics from Imperial. And, and that really is the point. Go back to what Paul is saying about being inspired and what Paul is saying about being inspired. These things are great, but they're actually engineering. I worry that by calling it science, we're producing this public dissatisfaction and distance, which is the problem you were addressing this morning. Mm -hmm. Final question for this round. Uh, my name is Ollie Orthorpe. I'm Managing Director of ST Microelectronics in the UK, uh, a member of the ELC, Electronic Leisure Council, and the Director of Centre. Um, 18 of, out of the 20 exhibits tonight are either fundamentally electronic or supported by electronics. And although you see the STEM initiative coming through and in increasing the number of maths and science uh, coming in, which is a great success, the number of students going into electronics and in our universities is declining by 10% each year, including this year. Okay? So in a fundamental supporting technology, we are failing. Uh, I have to say that I'm also on the um, Design and Technology Digital, which has just been formed. The grant to training teachers is £150,000 for the whole of the country okay. in electronics. Thank you. John, why don't we take, John Denham, why don't we take both the first question and the last question together? And they're both really about the type of talent we need to come through the system. One of them is about technicians, one of them is a particular area around electronics. What's the picture in terms of the talent that's coming through the system? And we'll hit the market in the next few years. Okay. The, the picture is. Well, the way the system's developing is, it, it, it is very clear that it needs to be much more responsive to the needs of employers. And so increasingly in vocational education, the public funding of skills is moving to, it's called train to game, but that's not the, that's the important point, to an employer-led system of funding. Which should mean, if you're looking at things up to the basic old-fashioned craft or technician level of standing, you should be able with your members to work with public funds or at least a contribution from public funds and training providers to get the sort of people you need. If you're looking at people at a higher level of skill than that, and you talked about the old polytechnics, there is an issue which we, uh, I think, will address in the years to come, which is where somebody goes beyond the sort of craft apprenticeship level to the next level of technical knowledge and to develop the skills at that level. That's an issue that we are aware of and you'll be hearing more from us uh, in the future. On ICT, I think there's a, it's, one of the things we've got to do is we need to understand across the whole skill system that if there is a particular problem that needs to be solved, and the system isn't solving itself. In other words, the employer organisations, the universities, the colleges, for skills councils, for whatever, are not managing to solve the problem. Then there has to be somebody who is prepared to step in and find the solution. And I'm saying now that, that is the role of government and the new skills funding agency that we're setting up next year. So if you've got a problem like your ICT one, we need to get ourselves into a position where we sit down and say, well, what, are, what is the issue or issues? Is it a training provider issue? Okay. In other words, we need to invest more in the teaching. Is it an image of the industry issue? Why is one sector doing less well than others? Or what? Now, in the past, I think it's been fair to say that problems can be identified for a long period of time, but nobody necessarily steps in and says, right, we're going to find the solution and deal with it. I'm trying to get my department, the skills side of my department, through the work we do on strategic skills, to be able to identify and tackle these types of problems. So I'd like to continue this conversation 
after today and see what we do about it, but it's a more general approach because we cannot have a situation where particular bottlenecks of skilled supply stop the whole of the rest of the system operating because there's a shortage of a few key people in a particular area. I'm going to come to Paul Dress in a minute on, on your question, Will, but Richard, you know, Will was suggesting that maybe we've got a, a perception problem here um, and how do we get over that? You run a science-slash-design-based business. When you're in the pub with your mates and you tell them that it's science-based, do they say, what on earth are you involved with something like that or go and do something more serious? What's the reaction? <laughs> What's the perception? Uh, well, the best reaction I get is when I talk to my nieces and nephews and tell them I'm an inventor. Uh, that always gets them quite excited. Um, yeah, but generally in a, in a way that kids find exciting, but then I'm actually, I don't describe myself like that to anybody else because it, it does come with a stigma attached to it. And, yeah, and that stigma, Paul, I thought you hit very hard today um, in your range of interviews, which is this perception is fundamentally wrong, and we're hearing it all the time here today. How can you go after that now in the next six months or so in your office? Well, we're today, I think, for the first time, embarking on a campaign which is the, has the support of the entire science community. So it's really important for us to be talking to the general population and really explaining that, that science is important across the sciences, so whether it's engineering <coughs> science or social science or physical science, whatever the science area, it has an effect on everyday lives. And to, to talk to them about things like, you know, science is not just about knowing facts, being able to identify elements in the periodic table. It's understanding that actually what's interesting about science is the process of, of discovery of what is not yet known the way in which, if you have an attitude to life, where as you're, as you're going about your everyday life, you're asking, well, why is that like that? You're developing an inquiring mind, which is just what we need in our society to be able to, for example, tackle some of the most difficult ethical science questions, which we are going to need the whole of the population to engage in, if, for example, we're going to realise the full potential of genetics to deliver more effective medicines. Now, we can't get over issues of patient confidentiality without having a national debate. To have that national debate, we've got to have a science literate society. And we've got to bust this myth that science is somehow elitist, just for the few, you know, the uh, men in the white coats type thing. And I think that today, we made a good start, but it's going to take effort.